Now, the other thing you have to appreciate, there's another important component to how immune responses are regulated. We originally thought of the immune system in a linear fashion as an accelerator. If you had the antigen, this is the piece of the virus or the bacteria or the tumor that with uh, receptors the immune system can recognize with the right co-stimulatory signals that's pushing on the gas. Um, you had this linear um, immune response that was generated. But about 20, 25 years ago, basic immunologists began to realize that because the immune system can actually be very dangerous if it's not carefully regulated, dangerous to ourselves, the immune system had to be regulated with breaks. So for every accelerator that pushes the immune system forward, that amplifies the immune system, there's, there's a set of breaks. And so there are many breaks um, that, uh, that turn off the immune system. And the analogy of driving a car is really, um, I think, quite apt. Uh, to drive a car properly, um, you need the steering wheel, but you need an accelerator and you need a brake. Now imagine a car where you had about um, 15 different accelerators and about 15 or 20 different brakes, uh, and that's basically the immune system. And for different kinds of immune responses, and also, as it turns out, for different tumors, there are different accelerators and different brakes that seem to be operative. And this is part of the immunotherapist form of personalized medicine, is to figure out exactly for Mr. Smith's tumor which accelerators to push on, which brakes to disable, which are going to be different than Mrs. Jones's tumor. So that's, that's one of, uh, really, the frontiers that we're beginning to think about. Um, the major approach to pushing on the accelerator to pushing anti-tumor immunity has been vaccines, but uh, some of the biggest breakthroughs um, have been blocking these breaks or checkpoints, and we call that um, checkpoint blockade. And as you can imagine, some of the really exciting opportunities that are just now beginning to come into the clinic are combination approaches where vaccines together with checkpoint blockers are being used in combination. So um, the key is that for cancer, also chronic infection, generally um, uh, T cell responses are hypoactive. Um, tolerance is, is really the operative state. And so for the treatment, we want to essentially enhance co-stimulation uh, but also block um, checkpoints. Uh, there are other immunologically mediated diseases that these insights are going to actually help us be able to treat much more effectively as well. So for autoimmune diseases, transplant rejection, their immune resp responses are hyperactive, and so the treatment is really to now block co-stimulatory pathways and actually engage checkpoints to basically turn the immune system down. And so one of the really exciting things for our field is that the cancer immunology and immunotherapy efforts that we're doing are actually providing a basis for therapies um, in the opposite direction, but using some of the same molecules and targets uh, in the reverse or converse fashion to treat autoimmune disease uh, and transplant rejection. So, um, so I mentioned to you um, roughly... Uh, uh, 10 or 15 accelerators, 10 or 15 brakes. Um, these are uh, some of the uh, accelerators and brakes. The accelerators are the green arrow with a plus. The brakes are basically uh, a red arrow with a minus um, that we've been able to discover um, through molecular biology uh, at, at the basic level. And what I've circled here are there are two of these um, targets PD-1 and CTLA-4, for which blocking antibodies have been FDA approved. Um, Anti-PD-1 just very recently uh, in uh, melanoma uh, this, this past uh, summer and fall. But some of these other guys uh, are uh, targets for which there are active clinical trials in progress, for which there are actually um, agents, most of them antibodies, that are in the clinic in early stage clinical trials as we speak, some of which are actually in combination. Uh, and there are a couple of other uh, of these that within the next uh, one to two years 
are going to further uh, go into the clinic. Now, in some of these cases, um, blocking these inhibitory checkpoints um, has tumor specificity because they are selectively upregulated in the tumor. So the tumor has co-opted these natural mechanisms of immune regulation by which we protect ourselves from autoimmunity to actually protect itself uh, from the patient's immune system going after and successfully attacking it. So for example, if you look at the major partner in solid malignancies, PDL1, the partner for this inhibitory checkpoint receptor, PD1, and you look um, just for example in kidney cancer, um, uh, here you have uh, expression, the brown is positive in normal kidney, and you can see there's virtually no PDL1 expressed in normal kidney, but these are two examples of kidney cancer where the expression is very highly elevated. So it turns out that in about 30 to 40 percent of cancers, a very diverse um, uh, tumor type ranging from melanoma, kidney, lung, and all of these, uh, there actually are these, um, uh, these very uh, different levels of expression here in the tumor. And so uh, these kinds of differential levels of expression sort of tag these as very promising targets to block when we know that biologically they're immune checkpoints, they're breaks on the anti-tumor immune response. Um, this was actually one of uh, the very first patients, um, a melanoma patient treated uh, with an anti-PD-1 antibody, and you can see uh, the tremendous reduction in tumor size uh, over uh, a, a three to four month period. So what this is teaching us is that indeed patients do have circulating in their blood um, T cells, lymphocytes, components of the immune system that are there ready to and trying to attack and eliminate their tumor, save for the upregulated expression of these checkpoints that the tumors have used to develop immune resistance. And I have to say, when we started these trials, I would have never imagined that simply blocking just one of these checkpoints would have been sufficient. Um, but in a number of cases, um, that's exactly what we saw. Blocking this just one checkpoint was sufficient to shift the balance basically in favor of the immune system, uh, and then the, the, the battle ultimately completely shifts. Um, this is an example of uh, what one sees. This is called a spider plot, in which um, each one of these lines um, represents uh, target um, metastatic tumor lesions that the radiologists measure. And this is looking at the change uh, in their um, total volume um, uh, with time of treatment. Um, so treatment starts here at day zero, and so everything starts at zero. If the tumors progress through treatment, uh, then uh, uh, these lines go up. Uh, if they uh, decrease or regress, they go down. And there are a number of things that you can see. This is uh, an example of nivolumab uh, treatment, one of the uh, anti-PD-1 antibodies in melanoma. And you can see that a lot of patients uh, are getting either disease stabilization uh, or regressions. Now, in most cases, um, the regressions are not considered complete responses because the radiologist says, well, I still see something on the um, CAT scan or on the X-ray. But what happens is that the responses tend to be very stable even after the antibody has been stopped. And so what this tells us is that uh, what we're doing uh, in these patients uh, is shifting the balance, um, empowering their immune system, and generating, in fact, this phenomenon of memory as defined by the fact that we then stop the antibody and uh, the patient's immune system remembers that it should be attacking all cells that express these particular antigens, namely the tumor cells, uh, and they maintain these responses. 
So this durability is one of the very, very exciting um, things that we have now noted. And um, this is just looking at the survival curves uh, in melanoma. This is ipilimumab, um, anti-CTLA-4. This is nivolumab, anti-PD-1. Um, this is now going out uh, towards three years. The 20% um, plateau in ipilimumab actually has been followed out now beyond um, five years. And so the bottom line is that the patients in which um, we're able to induce these immune responses, really maintain this in a stable way. This is the targeted therapy, vimirafenib, uh, uh, that is targeted to the 50% of melanoma patients that have a mutation in this oncogene BRAF. And what you see with the targeted therapies is that they work for um, a period of six months to maybe 12 months, and then the tumors develop resistance. So one of the major differences in the immunotherapies is that because they're not targeting the tumor, they're target, targeting the immune system, which itself can then learn and adapt. The memory component of that effect gives a durability that you don't get with these drugs. So um, uh, th this is actually the uh, results in lung cancer. Uh, when we started uh, with the anti-PD-1 drugs, no one would have ever thought that they would have played any role in lung cancer. Um, but indeed, uh, there seems to be a plateauing occurring around the um, uh, 20 to 25 um, percent level. Now, that tells us that we still have a long ways to go because um, when we go to sleep at night, we think about the 80 percent of patients um, that we haven't be, been able to capture by completely training um, their immune system. Um, but I think it's fair to say that we have made a lot of progress. Um, I think prior to uh, this, uh, the dawn of this age of immunotherapy, um, what uh, the world was used to seeing with uh, an FDA-approved um, chemotherapy or even targeted therapy was uh, a small shift in the median survival curve, but no tail on the curve, no group of patients that ultimately were captured into long, long-term multi-year remissions uh, and even potentially cures. What we've accomplished now with the checkpoint blockade has to capture uh, about um, uh, 15 to 20 percent, in some cases higher, such as melanoma and kidney cancer, uh, of patients uh, in about uh, maybe half of the different cancer types um, into this long-term um, uh, 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 disease progression-free survival. Uh, we're still a little bit reluctant to use the term cure, but we're seeing now patients that are out uh, five and even 10 years, some of the earliest patients treated with these agents. But where do we want to go? Clearly, the answer is going to be combination approaches that hit um, the immune system at multiple points to really help that integrated picture that I showed you in one of the earlier slides for all of the components of the immune system to be more strongly empowered to go after that tumor. Um, and ultimately, um, things like vaccines combined with checkpoint blockade and uh, combinations of checkpoint blockers, uh, which are already coming into the clinic, to really so-called raise the tail on this curve so that ultimately uh, the majority of patients, even with a diagnosis of metastatic cancer, um, can be able to truly look forward to having their very own immune systems empowered to keep their cancer at bay, if not eliminate it, um, for years, decades, uh, and hopefully, ultimately, the rest of their life. So this is where we're going, um, and this is where we're very excited that uh, we'll be able to make some very serious inroads.